Yeah, so let's talk about computation. And uh, so <clears throat> my background is degree in computer science and uh, did a couple years of software development and now mostly in crypto, spend time in crypto stuff, work in crypto stuff. So yeah, how about you, sir? Yeah, um, my background's very similar, software engineering. Um, and then I've worked in a uh, few different software companies and hardware companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking about this yesterday, like some ways to think about computation. And I'm not definitely not going to read this, uh, but I just was kind of walking through it. And I think like one way to think about it that I think makes some sense is like all, or to kind of ground it is all computation is ultimately done by physics, which is maybe kind of obvious, but you know, like all your computers doing all the CPU is doing is it's in a sense, just like, it's just running the physics, you know, it's just, it's a physical machine. It ha it's just following these physical rules. And mm -hmm. I find that kind of a, like, that was kind of mind blowing to me at some point, because I think with like, with computers and electronics, it sort of often mm -hmm. feels like there's some magic thing going on there. Uh, and they're mm -hmm. like, there, it, there's just something weird, but they're fundamentally, they're just like machines. They're just following the rules. And, um, so I was thinking, you know, like, in the most absolute broadest sense, you could think about, uh, you know, physical things. Like if you want to measure, if you want to compute, like the acceleration of a falling object, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, the easiest way to do that is to actually just drop an object and, and, you know, measure it. And, and in that case, like physics is computing it for you, mm -hmm. right? Like physics is kind of doing this. It's, it's, it's running your experiment for you. Mm -hmm. Um, or another example I have here is like, if you wanted to, you know, weigh, compare the, the mass of two objects, you could get like one of those beam scales, right. Mm -hmm. And you can put the objects there and the physics like executes and mm -hmm. you've, you've kind of set up almost like a little program kind of, you know, you, you have like an apparatus you've, you've actually like introduced something you've, you've made this apparatus, which mm -hmm. helps to like isolate the two objects and then mm -hmm. it, it it illustrates the result clearly, you mm -hmm. know, but I'll so there's, there's like, uh, I think what these two examples get at is there's like a innate ability for the environment to compute and we can build tools and sort of probe it to guide computation or to kind of, you know, so, yeah, constrain the system so that we can get the structure to compute what we want to mm -hmm. compute. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. We can kind of set up like, yeah, because the physics just does whatever it does. It's always following the same, the physical rules. And then we can kind mm -hmm. of like build little set up little things and then just let it run and it will kind of give us answers. And I think mm -hmm. in a sense, that's all, that's like all of what computation is trying to do is construct better physical like arrangements of atoms, blah, 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 to give mm -hmm. us like more precise, more, better answers to more complicated questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's a, it's an interesting pers way to think about it. Like you have at this base layer, this computational resource, which is like whatever is composing the physics and the universe. And then somehow we're building tools on top of that which are also constrained by the same physical laws, but give us like that extra control and ability. Mm -hmm. It is, it's weird. Yeah. It's a weird thing. <laughs> yeah. It's super weird. And there are, um, there are, there's like a, a branch of whatever it is, physics with its computational physics, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And they're trying, they try to like figure out because computation is running inside physics, you can come up with, you know, like physical physics boundaries on the computation. So right. with, uh, and I think that's a big thing in information theory. They talk about like the 
entropy. And I know there's like two different entropy. There's like the physics one and the computation one. They're kind of different or they're the same. I don't know, but you can, you can just, you can d d determine like the minimal amount of energy required to flip a bit. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not like, they're not talking about like, oh, this is a MOSFET transistor bit or whatever. It's like, no, there's an actual fundamental like information kind of limit encoded in physics where that stuff actually has like a physical, there's like a physical law about it. Right, right. Like a lot of that information theory, what it deals with too is um, the sort of constraints on how much information you can communicate, you know, or the minimal amount of information to communicate a certain um, set of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, um, yeah, and I think that's what Shannon, Claude Shannon, one of his big things when he, I think he basically is the father of information theory. I think he, the, I don't think that the field really existed until he did a bunch of his work and yeah and yeah he talks about how uh like the entropy of some data is related to the like the minimum number of bits that could encode that data right right yeah yeah and i think that's like the bit is like the foundation to information i think that kind of came from shannon as well <clears throat> right um, and then, like, you know, given a message of a certain size, you can compress that. Mm -hmm. And that compression, how much you can compress that message, you know, if the original message is like 50 bits, you can compress it to 10 bits. You know, the real information in that message is just the 10 bits. Yeah. The other stuff is excess. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And then you have like, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, to, to illustrate that, if you, you could have, uh, say you have a hundred bit string, but it mm. happens to all be, be all zeros. You could compress that a lot because it's simple in a sense. Uh, you could write like, you know, it depends how you encode it, but it's like, just, it's like zero times 50 would be one way to compress it. And that's a lot smaller. Right. Yeah. Whereas, um, so that string would have low entropy i'm pretty sure it's low entropy whereas if you had a, a bit string like maximum entropy is random if, if you mm -hmm. have a bit string where there's no there's like no discernible pattern it's mm -hmm. it's, it's random then worst case you can't compress it at all and yeah. it's 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 50 bits it's maximum entropy and uh so i guess that's you why to send everything yeah you have to just you can't compress it mm -hmm. and i think that's why in in randomness, they talk about you need a source of entropy. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that's what they're referring to is like, because the entropy is like the randomness, it can't be compressed and you mm -hmm. need like a, a source of that to do random, random stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, if we're talking about like physics, constructing like apparatus and these like machines to help do um, computation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another, so you could start with like the scale. Another example I have here is Archimedes, uh, you know, like submerging a sphere or an object in water. Mm -hmm. And then you see how much the water rises, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, that's like a physical computation of the volume of an object. Mm -hmm. And, and to actually compute like a, an irregular shaped object, you know, to compute that with any other method is like pretty hard because mm -hmm. it's like, you'd have to take a million measurements and right, right. so like submerging it in water actually computes really efficiently. Um, but then, uh, so yeah, then I think the machines kind of. Well, like these examples, they're, they're directly, it's like yeah. with, with the ball in the water, they're kind of directly measuring the thing that we care about. When mm -hmm. in computation, we get into this thing where we start to represent stuff, not directly. We start to bring numbers in. So, mm -hmm. you know, rather than like, if I want to physically compute like the distance between two things, I'd have to like measure. 
Whereas if I can, uh, or like if I want to physically compute like the area of a triangle, I might like put little tiles on there or whatever. But mm -hmm. if I, what you do in computation is you start to abstract that triangle using numbers, and then you can use computation to compute with math, the area. Right. Right. So like in the case of, uh, Archimedes here with his, uh, spherical ball emerging submerging in water to uh, get the volume of the ball um, we eventually developed like calculus and certain uh, mathematical approaches that would allow you to calculate volumes of, of objects but um, in that in his case he's using like just a purely uh, analog raw, uh, method of computing the volume mm -hmm. um, and yeah there was it does seem like at some point we abstracted um, yeah and I think um, the uh, yeah like we had the abstractions before you know like in math in general since going back you know for 5,000 years or whatever it is they've had these, you know, like I think the, the formula for the, the volume of a sphere is pretty old. Actually, I think it might not be that old, but take the formula for the area of like triangles and stuff that's been known since way back, like the Greeks, yeah, at least the Greeks, at least yeah. the Greeks. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. they've understood that you can take in like, cause they knew they, that you could map the math to the physical world. The math was mm -hmm. kind of the idealized, like platonic, uh, version. The platonic triangle like it's pure realm of math everything's like clean but yeah they knew you you know you're taking a you, there's clearly triangles in nature and all that stuff and you're taking it into this abstract realm where you can do math on it and then instead of walking paces or like trying to find the area of a giant triangle you just you know abstract it into the math realm and you can do it on paper mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and these are still though, these are still calculative in the sense that, um, you know, where does, where is the line between computation and calculation drawn? So that's something I'm interested in, in mm -hmm. probing further because it's not clear to me exactly for in my mind, I would put first like calculation as a more manual process, mm -hmm. something that's like, um, or it involves, you can, I think one working definition could be calculation involves active participation by a human mind, whereas computation um, is om almost has some, uh, uh, automatic properties associated with it where it's calculation uh, um, that's been uh, separated from human participation it's been um, made automatic mm -hmm. maybe that is like a, a, a way to think about the difference between computation and calculation yeah <clears throat> I think there is in computation, I think there ha there should be an element of algorithmicness. You know, you're like, yeah, because like, what's the difference between doing like real math where you're doing like the creative, like topology, figuring out some theorem or whatever that yeah. to me, it's like, that's not computation. That's like deep, creative, analytical thinking. Right. And, right. and I think computation, the difference between like that kind of deep creative, like f kind of free flowing thinking and computation is computation should have some element of, yeah, like a mechanistic mm -hmm. routine, uh, algorithmic. Um, but I think, I think computation in the kind of broad definition can be done by humans, you know, like the, and I think that's the, I was reading about some of the early, 
like some of the history of computing and mm -hmm. they would often have women uh, doing the computation and they called them computers. <laughs> right, right, yeah. That um, was re really popular in the early, I mean, programming. Yeah. The whole early programming was, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was segregated yeah. where the men would make the hardware, I guess, and then women were doing yeah. like the, the, the coding yeah. and, the, and the, the computing. Yeah, where I'm familiar with this is with the uh, NASA miss missions, mm -hmm. where the uh, the men would figure out what to compute, but then pass off the actual act of computing to the computers, which are often women. Yeah. Um, because they, my understanding of how they viewed the uh, task of computing because it's constrained in a lot of ways they thought that is and because it's sort of mechanistic they didn't put a lot of value into it um yeah which is interesting yeah so yeah there is that sense where there's um the there's like a mechanistic nature of computation you have a uh an algorithmic kind of thing that you want to execute and it's so explicit that you can just step through it step by step um and compute what you desire mm -hmm. which is sort of similar to calculation so like like you could call that calculating so i yeah i think that for me i like the definition of computation and calculation they do seem very very similar I think there's some room in the computation side, especially now with modern computers where it's been automated. So I would call like what those girls were doing at NASA or possibly some men were there too, but I, I would um, put that as calculation, right? Not computation mm. in today's terms. And then I would put computation being the same process, but automated, where the human is no longer in the loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> certainly that's how we think of it today. Like, so, no one, whenever we talk about computers today, we're not talking, we never talk about people being computers. That's kind of yeah. a, anachronistic, like, just leftover etymology kind of thing almost. Yeah. So, like, the uh, computation is maybe automated calculation mm -hmm. yeah but it's yeah it's just terminology so yeah yeah and then so in the history you know like i kind of i was thinking about how do we go from how do these like machines evolve how do these apparatuses apparati evolve over time to bring us closer to computation as we think about it today. And mm -hmm. I mean, we don't, we could spend forever talking about the old, old history, but one of one that's interesting is the abacus, mm -hmm. right? And I don't, I've never used one, I don't think. Um, but I think I get the gist of it. Like it's, it's not quite a computer. It's like an aid. It can, but it can help like people who are good with ab abacus they can calculate stuff really fast, mm -hmm. apparently. Cause you're just, mm -hmm. you learn, you kind of become the computer. You learn like how to use it. So it's like mm -hmm. multiplication. I think it's like, boom, slide bead, slide bead, slide bead. And like you follow some steps that mm -hmm. are quite uh, algorithmic. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of just read out. It'll like allow you to just read out the answer. Like mm -hmm. three beads here, that's like three and then point here's like five beads. So it's 3.5, mm -hmm. something like that. I'm assuming yes, that's yeah. how it works. That's how it works. Yeah. That's my, I, I haven't used an abacus either. <laughs> I've seen people use it. Yeah. And it is, it's kind of like the slide rule, mm -hmm. um, yeah. where it's like a, uh, analog computer. You provide there's some algorithmic steps, you set it up, you perform some algorithmic steps and then you can read off the answer mm -hmm. and it, and you don't have to, you know, compute, say, multiplication in the most explicit sense, like the, the, the uh, physical structure of the device kind of encodes the, the calculation. 
in a in a weird way, where you when you mechani- mechanistically move the pieces of the device, it um, it yeah. uh yeah it calculates gives you the design yeah it, it calculates yeah and I think um yeah it's it's really interesting because so another like uh, another example of like an analog comp computing device that's really simple and easy to understand is say you wanted to build like a multiplier and this is going to transition nicely into like Babbage and all this stuff. But mm-hmm. if, if you want to build like a multiplier, a simple way to do that, which maybe wouldn't be that useful, but it would work is you could have like, you could use gears. So mm-hmm. suppose your input, I want to multiply, I want to build a multiply machine that just always multiplies by, uh, whatever, let's say like pi or just like mm-hmm. five or something, but pi is mm-hmm. maybe more useful, I guess <clears throat> you could have a gear, which is your input. And let's say one rotation is one and you have some way to track how many rotations you've done, but you that, that allows you to do decimal. Like I could do one point, like one, mm-hmm. whatever. And then you just have another gear that, um, the ratio between your, your mm-hmm. main gear, your input gear, and the other one is like pi. So mm-hmm. as long as I think the, if the circumference of this one is like one and the circumference of the other one is made to be pi about then right like that should work where i would rotate one rotation uh or maybe that would that would be like dividing by pi i think i think yeah the, yeah, the, yeah yeah the input yeah. has to be like pi and the other one has to be like one exactly yeah yeah and then one rotation and as long as you had some like some thing that was like moving or some way to keep track then mm-hmm. i just do like i do like two rotations and this this little like uh yardstick measuring thing would be like Six point two eight, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh So that's multiplying pi by two. Yeah. Two rotations of the gear, right? Rotate this other gear, which then cause the count yeah. to go up. Yeah. So instead of having to, you know, explicitly multiply with some like calculative algorithm on paper, you have this machine that the physical structure of it is such that you turn that gear and it gives you the output that's desired. Yeah. Which reduces the cognitive load because now the only thing you have to concern yourself with is that you provide the correct input and that you're able to read the output. Yeah. Everything that's happening in the middle is is mechanic, uh, mechanical and uh, you don't have to worry about it. As long as you're, in that sense, your computer is built spec yeah yeah and then like this in this kind of in that example that would be an analog computer uh Mm -hmm. like it's not it's not digital and it'd be non-programmable because Mm -hmm. it literally does one thing and i can only do one thing and if i wanted to build a you know like a whatever what's i'm trying to think of a different constant like multiply stuff by the square root of two yeah, yeah then yeah. Uh, i have to build a new machine with new with new gears <clears throat> yeah but i think um that's kind of the approach that these guys were taking like babbage his stuff's way more sophisticated than that but mm-hmm. they were trying to build these like and you know there's the even older one the antithicara mechanism i don't know if you've looked that up uh right that's a this is a greek one yeah yeah well the, even take the take the abacus it's basically that same type of thing but it's general enough to allow for you know yeah multiplication of many different um values i don't know if it supports more than two operands like you know or not but yeah <clears throat> it at least supports multiplication of two operands mm-hmm. so that's like if you if you take our uh, first computer there that's just multiplying a number and with the gears, that's a very, very constrained computer. Um, can only really compute the multiplication of the, of the one digit. Whereas the abacus is more general purpose, would be more in the direction of a general purpose computer because it can compute with many different operands. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, and then with like this Antikythera thing, 
So this, I think, is pretty similar to the gear thing. It's using a system of gears to like compute uh, astronomical positions of all the planets and stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this stuff goes way back. This is like, this is Greek, you know, so it's 20, whatever, mm -hmm. 200 mm -hmm. BC or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, and then like Babbage uh, got into, you, I think it was a similar principle. Like a lot of the stuff was on gears. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, but it's way more general where I think with his analytical engine, you could do all kinds of, uh, all kinds of more complicated stuff. I don't know exactly what. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not super familiar with, uh, Babbage's work, but I do know that he's sort of cons considered the, uh, the, if you go to modern computers, he's, his an analytical ed engine is sort of considered the birth of the development of modern computers. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I think he never actually got around to fully constructing it in a way that worked, but he had really uh, solid designs on paper. Mm. And so like it theoretically you could do a lot, but uh, I'm not sure exactly the uh, extent of what it could do. Yeah, <clears throat> I think the diff so there was the difference engine, which he actually built and that one was simpler. Uh, like I think it was pretty sophisticated, but yeah, it did pol polynomial functions. Yeah, that's pretty complicated Yeah, to have a mechanical, <laughs> you know, if you ask me to build a mechanical thing that can compute polynomials. Yeah, yeah, it's complicated, very complicated. And then the analytical engine was apparently, yeah, it was fully general purpose and uh, mm. Turing complete by modern standards, because right. even though this is, this precedes Turing, which maybe we can talk about in a minute, mm -hmm. but it had arithmetic logic unit, control flow, branching mm. loops and memory. So it had like mm -hmm. scratch, it had like scratch memory and that's pretty much all you need. And if you have that, you're Turing complete, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing, really amazing, but was never yeah, built. This was uh, 1800s. Yeah, 1837. 1837. Yeah. So purely a mechanical machine, and and I guess this is maybe a good time to talk like what is meant by general purpose, you know, like um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, one more thing, if I may, that I, I just like I like uh, analogies and. Uh, you know, flowery imagery and stuff. But <laughs> I like to think about, this is one of the things that really blew my mind about computation is, uh, I sort of mentioned this already, but thinking about how, you know, what's going on in computation is just physical processes. And mm -hmm. you could, you know, you even take a modern computer and uh, you could instantiate that modern computer with, switches like physical in theory physical switches and like people do this in minecraft where they which is absolutely insane they'll go in the minecraft world which has its basic physics right mm -hmm. and then like they'll use like water flowing or whatever mm -hmm. they have these certain like stones they use it doesn't really matter though but they they build out this like a physical machine where mm -hmm. it's like it takes two like water flows and these two pipes and uh, if, 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 if water's flowing in both of them, it'll flow out the output. If water's right, flowing in like only one, gate. yeah, they, so they can build AND gates, mm -hmm. and, uh, which maybe we'll talk about later. But, but uh, it's just crazy to think that it's really just a physical machine. And if you could right. build, you know, like in theory, you can't do this in real life, but you could take a modern <laughs> processor and mm -hmm. build it out of like wood and, wood and stuff. And, uh, yes. like yeah. it, it wouldn't work cause it'd be, it wouldn't work for lots of reasons, but, but in theory, there's no real difference. So, right. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's an important point because the, um, there's, there's many different instantiations of how a computer can physically work. And so like, 
you know, modern computers, a big paradigm in them is this digital logic and and OR gates, you know, um, and you can create those AND and OR gates through any physical thing that can give you the properties of an AND and OR gate. So it could be water flowing through a stream, right? If want, if both of them, if water's flowing through both streams, then the output, then there's water flowing through the output stream, that is an AND gate, right? If it has those properties, then and it satis if it satisfies the properties of an AND gate or an OR gate, that's all you really need. Um, and then modern computers are just this at scale with really high quality uh, physical devices um, to instantiate that logic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like that is the, that is the main fundamental point is that if you can make a gate, mm -hmm. then you can have everything else. And there's these universal gates. I think they're called universal gates where it's, um, it's like NAND, I can't remember where it is, but there's like two different ones that are universal where using just combinations of that type of gate, you can yeah. build everything else. Yeah, I think it's I think it's and and or. Um, but there is also logic, a logically equivalent um, uh, logical operators. So sometimes you'll see like NAND and NOR or something. That's probably not exactly correct. I should know this, but it is two operators. It's like AND and OR, and you can construct all like digital logic from those two. So, you know, there's like, there's more complicated operators um, like XOR and uh, what, what have you, but through AND and OR, you can construct all of the more complicated operators by making longer strings of AND and OR. Yeah. So you can reduce the entire set of digital or Boolean logic to just two operations. And I can't remember if there's if it's AND and OR or like NOR and, and AND or, or what have you, but you can reduce the entire set of, uh, of uh, Boolean logic, digital logic to two operators, which then gives you two gates. You know, you need to be able to make an AND gate and an OR gate. And from that, you can construct all of Boolean logic, which which is all of digital logic, which is most of what is in a computer. Yeah. A modern computer. <clears throat> yeah, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so well, should we get on to what? On to Turing, state machines? What do you think? Yeah, so I think there's... Um, yeah, we can go to we, we can go to Turing. Um, yeah. So we let's just so on the topic of you know these physical computers, difference between calculation and computation, you start to get into this idea of a general purpose computer, and what that is like. You know, you have our simple gear system, which is not a very good computer. It's hard. It's really hard configured just to multiply the one number. Then you have something like the abacus, which is a bit more general purpose, but still it's quite constrained where you can only really, I don't know, add or multiply, maybe subtract things with the abacus. Um, and then you start to get into um, more general purpose systems that can compute um, everything that is possibly computable. So, you know, you can, con you can, essentially reprogram it, set it up, you can reprogram it so it, so it uh, can compute arbitrary things. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we can also mention just, I'll mention a little bit about finite state machines. So yeah, as we're thinking about general computation and like, what does that look like? How do we get like a theoretical definition of like a general computing machine? Uh, you can kind of start off with simpler computing machines and, you know, we learned this in school in computation theory about these multiple like classes of computation machine. Mm -hmm. And one of the simpler ones is a finite state machine, which is just 
you know, you have this simple, like theoretical little machine that has different states. And mm -hmm. uh, often they use like an elevator as an example, um, or like a door being locked or unlocked. Mm -hmm. And it like, you have these states, a finite set of states, and then you have these transitions where there's some like input and mm -hmm. this, a certain sequence of inputs might get you to a, a certain state that you want. Whereas some right. other sequence gets you to something else. So make that picture there just large. You see that? So here you have like a locked and unlocked and you have, <coughs> excuse me, you have operations that transition you between the states. Yeah. And this is the starting point, this little black node. Mm -hmm. So you start off locked. If you, I guess, push the door, <laughs> it just you stays just, locked or yeah, something. You gotta pay. You yeah. Gotta you put pay. in a coin, it goes to unlocked. Mm -hmm. You put in more coin, it just stays unlocked. Mm -hmm. You push it, it goes back to locked, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is an example of uh, a system, a state machine that um, can be in one of two states and there's different uh, conditions on which it will transition. Mm -hmm. And you could instantiate this physically in the real world if you wanted to create this system. You know, you could use and and OR gates and and make conditions for those transitions to like physically instantiate it. Yeah. And so that could be done mechanically or with electrical components. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the, the thing with these finite state machines is they're not, there's a lot of stuff they actually can't do. Uh, you can compute some basic stuff. Like I think with a finite state machine, I think you can do some math. You can compute like... I mean, you can certain, well, I don't know. You could make a, easily make like a, a complex, uh, like matrix of these states. That's like a multiplication table, right? Yeah. And you just have yeah. transitions being like, multiply the starting number like three. And if I want to multiply by five as my next number, then it would just like map to 15 or something. Yeah. It would have to ch 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 jump like 15 times or something weird like that. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> but the thing with the finite state machines, there's a bunch of stuff you can't compute. So there's more complex, uh, more powerful version. There's a more complex, more powerful, like evolution of the finite state machine. Right. Uh, Maybe we should talk a little bit about what this is. So this whole discipline of, you know, looking at these finite state machines, um, what inspired this you know so we through history we had these like physical computing machines and they're they're able to do certain things and at some point people decided to try to abstract the essential properties of those physical machines into a theoretical framework that then allows you to study what computation is independent of the physical manifestation of the device so that's where you get into, so, you know, the finite state machines are abstracting the essential properties of, of, of uh, computers into these models, these theoretical models that allow us to study what can be computed without having to physically instantiate, without having worrying about the physical implementation. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is, a, this is a powerful abstraction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this, I think a lot of this, well, like, I think the theory of computation stuff got started around Turing. I think he was one of the earliest people, you know, like, mm -hmm. like we were talking about, people have been making computers of one form or another for a long time. And like even Babbage, you know, 1830 or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think it wasn't until the 20th century that it really, that the, the theory started to be laid out. And people, right. I think before that, they didn't even really th think that we sh that you should do that. Like yeah. it was like, you just build the machine and kind of analyze the machine. Yeah. But then it was a big, it was a huge, huge innovation to like abstract it out and come up with like a mathematical theory of computation. Yeah. And there's this in engineering, there's this usually really cool technologies, really well engineered things are this mixture of 
the practical with really nice theoretical properties mm -hmm. and where they can uh, play off of each other. And I think this is what happened with computers. Like you had these really low quality or kind of bad physical computers, uh, mechanical computers, things like that, that could do things. They were sort of useful, um, but it wasn't until you had this theoretical abstraction that allowed us to really study the true essence of what computation is, that then allowed us to get this deeper understanding, separate the physical from the theoretical, and then um, develop the field of computation ahead, the theoretical field of computation ahead of the physical manifestations. And so that's where you had guys like Turing, which, um, you know, really did a good job at extracting the uh, essence of a general purpose computer. Yeah. Which is his <clears throat> Turing machine. Yeah. Yeah. So just because I mentioned this already or was going to. <laughs> yeah. We have further evolutions of like the finite state machine, you know, like a push down automata uh, is basically a finite state machine that has a memory. It has like a stack mm -hmm. uh, and, and that allows it to, do, to do a bit more complex stuff. But the Turing machine is the big one because this is the general purpose computing machine. Uh, and this is the one that Turing came up with. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know the history of it too well. I know he was trying to solve this, this problem, the decision, the decision problem. Mm -hmm. But what it is, is it's this theoretical machine where like we can talk about like the architecture of it if we want, but it has a head and a tape. And I mean, it, it doesn't kind of, maybe doesn't matter too much about the architecture, but you have this infinite tape and it can read and write to the tape. Mm -hmm. You have this head, which is like the, the brain of the machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the brain contains some rules There's and rules of where it jumps to. Yeah. Yeah. And then it can read and write this tape mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty much it. I think, and that, that theoretical construction, it was to, figured out is like, there's no more powerful machine that can be built in, in terms of like anything that's computable can be computed by this machine, by a Turing machine. And that was the big discovery is because I think it wasn't known until this work was done. It wasn't known if like maybe it would have turned out that you could just continually build more powerful computing machines. And I mean more powerful, not in the sense of like faster, cause that's a totally different thing, but more powerful in the sense of like, maybe there's a machine, we build it, we build these computers. And then 10 years later, we find out there's a, there's one that can compute, uh, things that other ones j just couldn't compute. Mm -hmm. Like it just wasn't possible. It's not about like speed or anything. Right. It's, it's like if we go back to our first computing machines, the gear system, the abacus is more powerful than the gear system, the simple gear system, because it can compute with more operands. Um, and so it's true, before we had this theoretical framework, it wasn't immediately clear if, you know, you go from this gear system to the abacus and then some other, maybe the analytical engine that Babbage had, and that is even more powerful. And then maybe there's an even more powerful system past the analytical engine, right? It wasn't clear that you couldn't just keep creating more powerful machines that can compute more things. Um, so this study of uh, computer science and pulling these uh, these the essential properties of computers into the theoretical realm al allowed us to describe the general properties of what a computer is and see that, you know, if you have a memory, you have the ability to read and write the memory, you can then compute a whole class of things. And um, there's, you know, different physical manifestations of that you know, whether it's in a digital computer or me mechanical one, but there's, as far as the uh, Turing machine is concerned, that is 
it describes everything that can be computed in that sense. Like, um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So an, another way to describe this is what it means for a Turing machine to be general and like kind of the ultimate computer is that any, any other computer, any, any other, any other computer you can imagine can be implemented or emulated by a Turing machine. Exactly. So yeah. there's, there's no equivalency property yeah. where you can, you know, you say you take your, your abacus, you could run the abacus on the Turing machine, yeah. you know, you could, you could simulate, emulate an abacus on the Turing machine or you could emulate the gear system on the Turing machine or the analytical engine on the Turing machine. Yeah. So it has all the essential properties <coughs> um, for computing what is possible from our understanding currently. Yeah. And a Turing machine can emulate a Turing machine. Yeah. Which is interesting. I mean, I think that's maybe an obvious result, but, but because it's general, like, any two Turing machines should be able to uh, implement each other or uh, emulate each other, right? Because mm -hmm. they're they're equivalent and they're at the top of the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that, there's that diagram there that shows um, the different computational classes. Like if you make it larger. Yeah, it's okay. uh, it's it, it's not actually an image. It's like a there's links in it. So I oh, I see. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, like the Turing machine is the biggest. It contains all of the other like subordinate, uh, all the other computing machines are a subset. These mm -hmm. are like, this is kind of describing what can be computed. So a finite state machine can compute everything a common combinational logic can do. Mm -hmm. Push down automata can do all that. Turing machine mm -hmm. can do everything everything um so yeah this was a big innovation uh we could talk about complexity, we talk about yeah. complexity? yeah yeah so we have we have the let's just we had the uh, physical computers then we had this theoretical separation um and then turing kind of you know he uh, preempted the physical manifestation of an actual computer that properly implemented a Turing machine, which was really interesting. Is that's another sign of really good progress in, in a field is if you can have some theoretical uh, framework that actually pushes what can physically be realized. That's a, that's a really, really fantastic thing. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, I guess, the computational theory didn't stop at just Turing machines and um, these push down autonomous and these other finite state machines that kept going. And then you get the ideas of complexity. Um, yeah. And complexity classes. Yeah. So then the idea is like, okay, here's another analogy I like, another like, uh, flowery analogy is that I think I like to imagine the this these classes of computing machine and I'll, I'll, I'll bring in complexity to this too but I like to think of these these classes of com computational machine as like spaces right so that kind of fits with this diagram too is if you imagine like a Turing machine in a sense what it does is it gives you a space like a, a space of computation and mm -hmm. Inside of that, like just imagine a big black, you know, space. In there, you can build any arbitrary little piece of machinery, and these little pieces of machinery are like uh, little computational machines. You know, if you want to add numbers or you want to multiply, or you want you want to do any exponentiation, you want to do any operation on some data, you can build that in this in this Turing space. And the the lower computational machines would give you access to like a smaller space. You could think of them like concentric spheres or something. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, each one of them, you know, that you have the space, the Turing space is the biggest. Um, it can contain all these other spaces. And mm -hmm. 
the the space you can think of has i think of it like almost having some laws of physics and, and those are kind of like the laws of computation and the, what another the, the sort of like i think of the size of the space as being limited by the memory so mm -hmm. if you imagine like the you have this space and the amount of memory you have determines uh you could even think of the space being like pixelated like 3d voxel space and the number of pixels you have in which to construct your your abstract mathematical machinery um, and to feed data into it and have them do things the size of that space is determined by your memory and if you have you know 32 gigs of memory you have this huge space you can work in and that's like your that that entire space that's determined by your memory is like live all at once it can be like mm -hmm. in motion so to speak and the and actually because Comp, the CPU, the co actual thing that's doing the computation is mostly serial. You can have multiple threads, but it's mostly serial. Uh, or like even say it's eight threaded. That stuff you know a lot better than me, James. But uh, you have that 3D space. It's say 32 gigabytes in size. That space there is like quick access, changing pretty quickly. But the CPU head is in a sense like running through that space and updating things mostly mm -hmm. Like the entire space can't update just at once, you know, mm -hmm. as like in physics, we have this, a 3d space, everything can kind of happen to, at the same time in parallel. At least that's how it looks, right. you know, it right. depends who, who you believe. Uh, but in, a, in this computational space, you have this, this like CPU head going through there. Yes. Yes. I think, yeah. So like, uh, Turing machines, they are sequential. The theoretical mm -hmm. definition of them are sequential. Um, in practicality, like modern computers do a bunch of things in parallel, but that those parallel computations can be reduced to sequential operations, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And because, because it's happening so fast, it can just seem like it's happening in parallel as well. You know, like mm -hmm. if you're playing a video game, all that stuff is, I mean, then graphics cards are, are more parallel, but. Yeah, but the still, GPU is by it updates each pixel all at the same time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you, it is fundamentally parallel. But that operation can be reduced to a set of sequential. Yeah. Um, yeah. And back in the day, like early computer games, there was a time when they just ran on the CPU. Mm -hmm. There was a pre-GPU time, and the CPUs were also purely single-threaded at some point. So, mm -hmm. if you if you're running fast enough, you can update like a whole frame yeah uh, in serial and, it, and it, i think with that too like the turing machine definition um depending on which specific theoretical definition you have you can have multiple heads that are that are stepping at the same time and writing to different sections of the tape sections of the memory right and that gives you the parallel um capability to be expressed in the turing machine Right. <clears throat> and then so to extend that, this computational space analogy a little further, the, um, so we have this computational space. It has these sort of rules of physics. It has this like 3d size determined by the, by the memory, the Ram. Uh, and then you can imagine as well, like, because the c modern computers have more storage as well, not just the Ram. It's like the, the, the space you, your like dynamic space is like 32 gigs, let's say, but then mm -hmm. you can have this entire realm that's a terabyte in size. And that's like your total space for this, this specific computer. It's the size of its little universe. It's computational space is maybe mm -hmm. a terabyte. That's how much mm -hmm. it can work with, but that, mm -hmm. but that territory outside of the 32 gig, you know, voxel sphere or whatever is like frozen. So if you want to animate it, you have to move that like, 3d window of ram so you have to freeze save a bunch of stuff offload it out of ram like kind of freeze some of that territory and then you can animate new stuff and uh i think this so then another thing with that thinking about it in terms of the space like this is like what are the physics of the space and this kind of gets into the the complexity theory because complexity theory is trying to like classify 
different kinds of computation. So like there's these different almost like species of, of uh, abstract computational machinery that you can build inside of a space like this. And the complexity theorists are trying to classify them into like how, what are the classes? And, and they do that in terms of generally how like simplified, I think, but how much, how long they take to do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like the species thing because they even, there's this great site, the, the uh, complexity zoo. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. describes it in terms of like a zoo full of these things. Right. Right. So like with these, with the Turing machine, you have this capability. You have this general capability of computing things. It's constrained in some ways. You can read and write and jump around. But then within that, you can start to ask the question of, okay, like what type of things can be computed? What type of problems can be computed? And is there differences in complexity of problems? Like are all problems created equally? You know, if you're if you're asked to do something, is is that analogous to doing some other thing? Like, um, is there inherent complexity, inherent difficulty in certain types of problems? So, you know, our Turing machine, it can compute all of these things, but does it have any theoretical limitations on, is there sets of problems that it cannot compute sort of how our gear system cannot compute the set all this all the problems that the abacus can compute mm -hmm. is there sets of problems that the turing machine you know cannot compute because it's outside of its uh space in terms of um what it's capable of expressing yeah and uh that was actually one of the motivations for Turing's paper where he proposed the Turing machine, I think is it was this, this deciding problem. Mm -hmm. And the question, if I recall correctly, is they're trying to understand, like given some problem that I think is well-defined with an algorithm, uh, mm -hmm. would it be possible to decide that question in terms of yes or no? Like suppose it's presented as a yes, no question. Mm -hmm. Is it possible in theory, just in theory, to like always decide it? Right. And what Turing showed is that you, if that you can't, <laughs> like, yeah, if Thanks. you you might be able to decide it, like given a problem, you might find the answer. It might be decidable, but in principle, you can't know. There might be problems that you know you just run forever, and yeah. you, you don't know if it's going if it's going to decide or not. So like given us a, a Turing machine, can it compute every, can it come to a final answer on every set of uh, programs that you give it? Yeah. Or are there some programs where you don't know necessarily if it's gonna come to a solution? Is it, is it gonna stop executing? Yeah. And this is like the halting problem where yeah, given a program, you given a program and some inputs, you can't tell in general, like you can't tell for all programs whether they will halt, right? Whether they'll decide. All you can do is run it. And you might run it for like a thousand years and then it completes, or you might run it for a thousand years and it might take it might just be running forever. And uh there's no way for a computer to like decide ahead of time, like a computer can't inspect a program with some inputs and decide ahead of time, like, oh, this will finish. And I think that's part of why um, you get those windows like progress bars and they're like, they're never right. Yeah. It, it's part, it's kind of is this thing is like a computer There's can't. There's also the network latency. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But a, a computer can't, oh, yeah. uh, it can't look at a program and say, this will take five minutes. Yeah. Unless, unless it's like a well-known you know, if you want to count on a computer, you want to calculate like X digits of pi using a specific algorithm. It'll, yeah. it'll be able to tell because it can figure that out. Cause you've run it before. Yeah. You've run it before and measured. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. how you can estimate the time. And if you can also extrapolate like 
if you know how it's working, you can probably, even without running, know if I want to get an extra digit. Yes. It'll take maybe, it, and that kind of gets to complexity again, is if you know the algorithm is like N squared, where N is like the input, maybe yeah. that's like how many digits I want. And mm -hmm. you know the algorithm's like N squared. Yeah. Then uh, you might be able to tell, okay, if it took me five minutes to get three digits, then four digits will be like 25 minutes. Something yes. Like that. Yeah. There's certain problems where you definitely have predictability. Like practically you have predictability. I think one of the key points with the, the, the Turing issue of this undecidability is that there are some problems where you will not be able to have any kind of known predictability. Doesn't necessarily mean that all programs though, you cannot predict the computation path. I mean, yeah. take the simple example of just a very simple calculation of two numbers, right? You know that that's gonna, that's gonna come to a solution. And depending on your specific hardware, you could know exactly, you know, CPUs running at one gigahertz, you could know exactly the time that it's gonna take. Mm -hmm. It's where you get into these programs that use a lot of memory and have conditional things that, that read the memory to decide their conditions. When you get into these types of programs, you cannot necessarily know how long it's going to take to execute because there's too much kind of flexibility in what's being computed. And a lot of what's being computed depends on what was previously computed. And so you can get into these conditions where, you know, it can just get an infinite loop or what have you. Yeah. 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 So then, yeah, it, it becomes the, the only way, the quickest way to determine how long it's going to take is to run it. So you, and this kind of gets into the computational irreducibility, which we could talk about another time, but there's this idea that, yeah, you, you have this thing in computation where problems sometimes can't be reduced. Like sometimes if something's really in poorly written, I guess, or inefficient, you might be able to reduce the program complexity. You might even be able to like skip a bunch of steps and you know, like if you write a program to count to a million, uh, you can skip steps there. Uh, you, you know what it's, what the result's going to be after a million steps without running it. Right. But in like non arbitrary programs, you'll have these computational irreducibility, this, this property where like you can't, you can't look ahead, you know, you have mm -hmm. to actually step through. You can't look to what is going to be the, the state of this at step 1 million. Mm -hmm. And in some, in like the ultimate case, I guess you won't be able to know what happens at step 1 million unless you go through every single preceding step. You can't mm -hmm. skip a single step. Mm -hmm. That's where it's like truly irreducible. Like the amount of right. steps can't be squished any smaller. Yeah. You know, you have to yeah. walk through the whole thing. Right. It's and, like, if I give you a program and I, then I ask you like, you know, what is the state of the memory going to be after running this program for, you know, 20,000 seconds. And if that program is complex enough, there's no way that you're going to be able to under to predict what the state of the memory is going to be 20,000 seconds into the execution of the program without actually just executing the program. Yeah. But there will be certain programs where you can predict that because it's just a very, very simple program. But there are this class of programs where you do not have this predictability. The only, the, the only way to know what the program is going to do is to actually execute the program. You cannot know what its output is going to be beforehand. Where if we come back to like Archimedes and his um, volume calculation, right, where he's uh, <coughs> submerging uh, a sphere into water to calculate its volume, right, that's a type of problem where you can, um, using like calculus and using clever algorithms, you can kind of uh, short circuit the, um, the calculation. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, you can kind of do that in, 
especially if you're willing to trade off some some accuracy. You know, like in uh, in school we had CSE three forty nine analy analytical methods or something, like whatever it's called. <laughs> numerical. But, yeah, numerical methods or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there you're trying to in some in some cases approximate an answer using right. these like computational methods mm -hmm. where especially when you get into the into digital binary representing um like what do you call it numbers that are not like integers continuous, yeah like continuous, co continuous, values. continuous values become difficult and so you have to approximate yes, right? because yeah. you, you don't have access in a digital computer to like mm -hmm. a true even like pi right. you know your temperature your temperature yeah temperature is a great one like the temperature in my place is 24 degrees celsius but it's not actually 24 it's a continuous value and so you have to truncate it at some point yeah and um that truncation means that you're making an approximation and there's going to be error in the final computed value but yeah yeah that's well, sort of distinct though that's in terms of like are you getting a correct answer versus um the problem of determining how long your program's going to run um mm -hmm. it's a different yeah it is a different thing yeah but there there are cases i guess maybe that wasn't an illustration of what i'm trying to refer to here but there are cases where you can like reduce the program and make it more efficient you know and right and then you, yeah, you're just trying to get to the minimal number of steps. And in general, you're always trying to do that. Is... Sorting is a great example. Sorting is the perfect example of this. Like what is the best program to sort some alphabetical list? You can come up with a very simple program that's like uh, naive and compares everything with everything or something like that. Um, and that is not the most efficient thing. Um, but the, 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 you can come to the question of, is there some theoretical limitation on how quickly a list of alphabetical uh, words can be sorted? Alphabetical. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Sorting is a perfect example. And this is how they teach it in school too, is you start like given a list of things, you want to sort them. Yeah. They're, the naive way is, I mean, the really, the, mo the least efficient way is you just shuffle sort or whatever. I like yeah. that one. It's like, just shuffle the list and see if it's sorted and just keep doing that until it's sorted. Right. But <laughs> yeah, right. it takes shuffle, like, check, shuffle, check, shuffle, yeah. check. And yeah. eventually, you know, there's some probability that you get it. <laughs> yeah. But it, yeah. Could, it could take a long time. And then, yeah, you think like c compare each element to every other element and see where mm -hmm. it should be. And then you get to like bubble sort where mm -hmm. you're like just bubbling the values until they're, in like sort of the right place and you, you go through the whole list and then it sorts mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, mm -hmm. and that one's like n squared. Mm -hmm. So that's how a complexity theory is generally measuring these things. It's like, like I said earlier, if the, if the list is n, there's n elements, then the steps required in the case of bubble sort will be like n squared. Mm -hmm. So number 10, of operations. Yeah, yeah. Number of operations. So like 10 elements will be like a hundred ish steps. And it should say that it doesn't actually mean there will be a hundred steps because in complexity theory, you're, you remove the, uh, what do they call that? Like there, there could be, it could be like, uh, so N is your input. Mm -hmm. The actual time needed or steps needed to take could be like five N squared. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a constant that you There's just a constant. pull out. Yeah. You yeah. just drop the constant cause it doesn't make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, what matters is the, like the exponent or that term there. Mm -hmm. So like for a bunch of problems, what computer science, you know, came to is answers on the inherent complexity of those problems. So like sorting, there's a bound on the lowest number of steps required to sort a list, number of operations required to sort a list of a given size. And uh, there's proofs of what that bound is, like logical proofs um, that use math and other computer science constructs to establish what these bounds are. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So going back to the 
my like um, com computing space analogy, that's where you're classifying these, this computational machinery. Uh, so, and that's, a, it's not even that you're, you're classifying the computational machinery exactly. It's more like you're classifying the set of machinery that does like a certain task. So in the case of sorting, it's less interesting to think about like how, you know, how complex is bubble sort versus merge sort. It's more like what I care about is this kind of problem of sorting a list. Um, where does that fit in? Because you can, you can come up with a zillion different little machinery constructions to do the sorting, but it's kind of irrelevant. Like I want to know where does this job, this task, this problem of sorting sit in this mm -hmm. physics of computation. Um, and it turns out it's n log n is the optimal ranked by the number of operations. Yeah. Yeah. Ranked by the number so, of operations. So you have all these different problems that a Turing machine can execute and the problems you can then start to categorize them into different classes of complexity by finding these lower bounds. So like sorting, n log n, um, then say if you take another problem that's maybe distinct from sorting, like searching, you have a list and you want to search and find uh, some value in that list. That's another category of problem that computer science looked at and they found a bound on that, the number of operations. Then you can compare like, okay, how, what is more complex? What requires, what has the better bound or better bound meaning, uh, you know, uh, lower number of operands required to, to come to the solution, searching or sorting, which is, which, because we're talking here, like the number of operands is a proxy, you know, the number of operands to find the answer is a proxy for the problem's inherent complexity. If we know that those those bounds that we're finding are true, then you can start to compare problems in terms of their inherent complexity. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's also in complexity theory as well. Uh, you can measure not just the the number of steps that that needs to be taken, but also the amount of memory being used. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's an important factor too. It's like, because there are, you can often trade off and you can do complete a problem faster with fewer steps. If you have a large amount of memory, you can fill up a huge space with mm -hmm. like help this, whatever kind of structure and data that helps you f solve it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then do it and do it faster. But mm -hmm. both of these things, again, because computers have to be instantiated in the world, <laughs> in the physical world, uh, both of these, these factors of complexity, they map to the real world. And that's why we care because, you know, if, a, if a problem is like N to the N factorial, it means it's going to physically take a long time right. in the real world to do it, especially as those, those inputs get large, right? right. Like, when the inputs are small, like computers are so fast now that they can do a crazy amount of computation. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, for super small problems, it almost doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you, you know, if you have a problem that's like n factorial, mm -hmm. you get into like, like a hundred or something, a hundred factorial is insanely large, right? It blows up very, very fast. Yeah. And so that's the practical uh, application of this categorization of the problems is, um, Right now, in our society, there's lots of problems that we have that cannot be solved by computers, particularly in, say, biology, say, like the, the protein folding problems. Um, there's a high, because there's so many degrees of freedom in the problem, there's a high number of, a uh, very large number of oper operations that are required to, say, calculate how a protein is going to fold um, with the algorithms that we know now. And it you get this issue where you just do not have enough time. Your computer can calculate it, but you just do not have enough time to get to the answer. 
um, because of the speed at which the computer calculates and the number of operands. Um, so you start to segment these problems and, and divide them into their complexity and then you then start to realize that there's certain problems that do not fit into what is practically computable with our current computers. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then like in, in the case of protein folding and many other problems now, people are increasingly like, I think there's always work happening on the algorithm side to make things more efficient. Certainly there's people, you know, in post-grad programs doing that, that work. But then we've had the, and I don't think we'll talk about this much today, but the introduction of like machine learning, where mm -hmm. for a lot of these problems, like with the deep mind, deep mind. Yeah. Yeah. Deep yeah. mind's a alpha fold. Mm -hmm. So they're tackling this problem of protein folding, but rather than trying to compute it, like fully computing all of the permutations of the protein until you find the right one. If that's how it works, I think that's how it works. They'll apply the, their advanced machine learning and try to achieve, arrive at a more and more accurate, like a, a close result, a close answer, maybe not yeah. like perfect, but way faster than yeah. if they stepped through and just did it a brute force. Right. And, and much of, I think, I think much of machine learning is doing that. It's like, it's not that it's act, like we talked about the computational steps thing and how you have mm -hmm. irreducibility. It's not like it's breaking that, but it, it's, it's trying to like jump over some of that reducibility by doing approximations. Yeah. 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 It's, um, you almost like get to a better algorithm. So instead of having to explicitly define the algorithm for say searching or sorting or protein folding, instead of having to explicitly define the steps, I'd say what machine learning tries to do is like ex extract and, and create an algorithm. Um, so, you know, you have some machine learning algorithm, which is essentially trying to create an algorithm from data or, or what have you to solve your problem. So it's, all, it's almost like, you know, the, all those machine learning programs that are created, they're still constrained by Turing machines because they're fundamentally in that same paradigm. But what they're doing at best is finding a better algorithm. So, you know, when we write down like, oh, this is the optimal search algorithm, and we have like a, a proof of that being true, um, in the case of search, for example, you're not gonna get a machine learning algorithm that's gonna outperform that because we have this theoretical bound and we wrote down the optimal, uh, unless there's some large issue in that, in that, how that bound was derived but no machine learning program is gonna be able to outperform that, that bound. But for some of these problems, there's the question of like, do we have the right algorithm? Like, have we constructed the right algorithm? And some of them, they're such complex problems where attacking it by trying to just ideate and write down the best algorithm. So say something like protein folding or um, uh, self-driving car or something like that is a, it's a hard thing to do, you know? Like write down the sequence of steps for uh, driving a car in all cases. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. So what people have done is they develop programs that try to create algorithms that solve the problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it does lead to a lot of interesting questions. Like, you know, intuitively, I think it may be the case that um, yeah, you get into this problem where, you know, there may not be an algorithm that is actually, that exists, you know, it's like, it's like if, if self-driving cars or protein folding has this what level of inherent complexity, that's say like X, right? What I sometimes worry is that it's 
what we're trying to do with those problems is analogous to say taking the search which has this level of complexity and then thinking that we're gonna through some uh process find a better search algorithm you know like through the machine learning process we think that we're going to be able to discover a better search algorithm but the inherent complexity of search is such that there's nothing exists that can run on a turing complete machine that will do better than that bound and so it may be the case that analogously for some of these really hard problems they have this inherent complexity and uh there's the the uh practicality of our computers are such that no algorithm no possible algorithm that can run on it will be able to actually solve it with its required bound. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so what you can just do is like try to get to an answer, um, but it will never be super clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's super interesting to think about machine learning because I think in a sense, what it's doing is like with classical algorithms, you, you spend a bit of time in the search space of algorithms maybe a fair bit of time mm -hmm. and you, you find efficient algorithms and the, the people are doing the search in that space, mm -hmm. right? And they're doing it kind of manually and mm -hmm. they use math and proofs to maybe say, okay, this is as good as it's going to get. And mm -hmm. then like in, in the case of a search algorithm, they, the people search in the space of algorithms for good algorithms, then use that algorithm to search in their problem space for the specific problem they're trying to solve. Yeah. And, yeah. and, that's generally like programming is people exploring the space of algorithms and, and the things that can be computed, like the steps in the machinery, the computational machinery. And then with machine learning, you're kind of turning that in on itself and you're searching the space of programs using a program. Yeah. So like the, when you're, you know, I guess when you're training like a neural net, you're, you're sort of given this problem, given the training data, all that, you're like searching in that space for the right algorithm to classify these like cats and dogs or whatever. Yeah. So it's automating the discovery of an algorithm that can solve your problem. Um, but it's still fundamentally constrained in its execution and in the algorithm that it produces that that must run on a Turing machine. Yeah. So it's not necessarily the case that for these really, really hard problems, if they exist outside of the complexity of what the Turing machine is capable of computing, that this approach is actually gonna get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think um, with a lot of these problems, the, you know, like with, with driving or even classifying images, like we're so far I think from having, you know, like the theoretically optimal algorithm, and it's so hard to write that by hand that yes. the machine learning approach has been fruitful because yeah. these problems are just, it, they're so big and it becomes, you know, because I do think there is, there is some theoretical limit in there, but we're mm -hmm. the best way we've found to approach that limit has been this kind of alternative method of machine learning as right. opposed to a more, you know, programmatic algorithmic process. Yeah. But both fundamentally constrained by the machine that it's, that it's running on. And it's an interesting question. Like, are these problems in terms of their inherent complexity outside of the space of computation as the Turing machine described as the Turing machine um, instantiates computation or as it is describing computation. Right. You know, like, like finding it, a, finding a perfect solution because we can find rough solutions to a lot of these things. Yes. Yes. Finding a perfect solution. And then also too, like, it's not clear to me, like if your brain is analogous to a Turing machine, like can a Turing machine simulate the brain, you know? If, if, if for some of these problems, you know, like say the self-driving problem, you think that it re requires like simulating some of the essential functions of a brain. If the brain, if 
if the brain is the analytical engine to the abacus, you know, mm -hmm. then you need to go beyond the analytical engine. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I don't know what to, I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> because yeah, it's an interesting it. I think I think that it's a area that's probably like, well developed in computer science, like, in terms of, um, I, yeah, I think that I don't know too, too much about it, but it's something I'm interested in. Like, how do we know that some of these hard problems we're trying to tackle with Turing machines, how do we know that they're actually tackled? Like they, we can really solve them with Turing machines and that, um, you know, they're not outside of the complexity, you know, they're not outside of the space that Turing machines can access and find solutions. To. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe one more thing, and then we can, we can wrap if you want mm -hmm. is, um, we could just touch on quantum computers just briefly. Like it's a huge topic and I don't know much about it, but, but I, I think it's important or one point here that's important is, uh, to point out is, and I did a tweet about this a long time ago, but <clears throat> quantum computers are not more powerful than Turing machines in this sense of where it's like finite automata, Turing machine, quantum computers are not actually another larger realm of computing. And all that they're doing is, so there's this quantum magazine published this post or this, uh, article September, 2020. And I guess there was some discovery saying that they did actually show that quantum computers for sure are giving like a fundamental speed up, you know, it's not just that, like, it's not just that, uh, this algorithm we're executing on a regular Turing machine. Um, if you wrote a better algorithm, it would be like N squared right now. It's like, N whatever factorial or something, uh, it's not like there's actually a better, more, f a faster algorithm. Um, you know, like the, the quantum computer can execute certain things actually faster in fewer steps, like for real yes. fewer steps. And it's not just that there's a missing, oh, you just haven't figured out the right algorithm. It's like, no, right. there's actually a fundamental speed up, but, but because a Turing machine can fully emulate a quantum computer, right. it just it takes forever to do it. But. Uh, there, there's, there, there's, there's no like fundamental difference in terms of right. the power. They're in the same space of computing, but there is a practical speed up in that the quantum computer has a different physical way of computing that gives it quicker results, but it's still computing within that same space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's my understanding, but that is, it's a deep topic that, um, that is further discussion is, uh, probably valuable. Yeah. And I have a lot to, uh, uncover in that area. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's super interesting because again, it's just using physics and, but now we're actually with like a quantum computer, you're getting kind of down to the fundamental, like the deeper physics, like in a classical computer the fundamental physics kind of gets in the way. Like you want the computer to behave classically and you want like your electron stream to kind of go through its little path. And it's yeah. kind of just like a machine, like we talked about, like just switch, you know, just flow yeah. and switch. And, uh, but then, and, but then as you get really small, you start to get electrons like jumping around and yeah, it, it has a hard, it starts to have problems. The whole, the whole thing with modern computers is we just want clean digital logic, you know? Mm -hmm. So we have like really small physical components to give us that. And with, on the, on the quantum side, they want a fundamentally different way of mechanistically computing. Like the problem with current, like with current computers, we just want to be able to efficiently have digital logic. So instead of having the streams of water and, and to make the AND gate, we want to have these phys physical devices that do that 
really efficiently at a very small scale that we can manufacture at capacity. Um, whereas on the quantum side, they want to get away from digital logic. They want to get away from that. They want to have a new sort of mechanism of calculation. Um, and hopefully it works and hopefully uh, it succeeds because then you can solve some of some problems that we have uh, maybe uh, yeah. faster. Yeah, we'll see. <clears throat> All right. Um, anything else you want to add in there? No, I think it's good. Yeah, I think it's good. All right. Follow, follow me on, on Twitter. James is not on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, cool. See you, man. Good talking to you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks.